Hi, I'm Billy Bragg. I'm head of the team that brings left field to Glastonbury Festival every year, where we attempt to bring together pop and politics through music and discussion and create a space where people can come and recharge their activism. As we can't get together this year, we decided to run a couple of our famous panels to discuss some of the burning issues of the day. Although please be aware that these were recorded a couple of weeks ago, so people aren't absolutely up to speed on everything that just happened this week. Rosie Rogers is our curator of panels and she's hosting this first one, which is entitled Life and Lockdown, Hope, Solidarity and Allyship. Take it away, Rosie. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to this left field Glastonbury pre-recording. Uh, my name is Rosie and I curate the talks at Left Field. I've done it for about six years now. Um, and I also work at Greenpeace in my day job. So thank you, Billy, um, Billy Bragg for the introduction and thank you for to Glastonbury and to Billy and to everyone who have made a space for this really important conversation about hope and solidarity and allyship um, in these current times. So below um, the screen, you can see um, all the information about our guests and how to follow them. But I'm gonna do a really uh, short introduction. So firstly, I'm yeah, just so honored to be joined by these yeah, heroes of mine. Um, so firstly, we have Zara Sultana, um, and she is the Labour Party um, MP for Coventry South, and she was elected in the December 2019 election. She's been very vocal on many things, including climate justice, equality and racism, and you can follow her at Zara Sultana. Hi, everyone. And next, we have Aisha Thomas-Smith, and Aisha is the director of... Um, the Movement Building at NEON is a co-founder of KIN, a network for black activists and a PhD candidate at Goldsmiths, who is looking at the impact of neoliberalism on UK social movements. And you can follow Aisha at Aisha TS. Hi, hi. Great. And then we have Nim Ralph. And Nim is a trans activist and freelance writer and trainer and facilitator. Um, they campaign actively for trans rights anti-racism and climate justice and you can follow NIM at N-M-R-L-P-H. Hey everybody. And then we have Dr. Rita Issa who is a GP, academic and activist advocating on the climate crisis, migrant justice and the NHS and you can follow Rita at Dr. Rita Issa. Hello. Great so we have a about half an hour um, to have a conversation today. I'm just going to give a little spiel and then hand over uh, to our guests to say a little something each and then kind of have a conversation together. And of course, this is just one uh, one conversation and we'd uh, love to carry it on uh, next year at Left Field, hopefully um, IRL in a sunny field in Somerset. Um, so John Harris uh, put on a panel as well, which hopefully you've seen, which is kind of about the last few months and um, everything that's been happening. And this panel is more about kind of looking forward and reflecting on the moment we're in, but looking looking to the future. So I just want to um, start by saying that I know there's a lot of pain um, and a lot of hope out there. And just to say a huge amount of love and solidarity for those who are feeling pain and loss and suffering and burnout right now. Um, I just want to acknowledge that. At the same time, um, there's also a lot of hope out there. You know, we've seen people taking to the streets globally to challenge racism and in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement in incredible and systemic ways. We've seen people and celebrities who usually stay silent on the issue being vocal about why trans people should be able to live their lives in peace um, and live, you know, live who they are. We've had conversations about how we can build a new economy that works for people on our planet and what that looks and feels like and it feels in our grasp. We also have a you know, renewed sense of respect for care workers in our NHS um, and you know, all of the clapping and everything has been amazing to see and communities coming together for mutual aid and other things. So gathered with me are some amazing individuals who fight for equality every day and we're gonna hear from them. So first off, I'm gonna pass to uh, Zara who's gonna talk to us a bit about climate justice and politics. Over to you. Thank you so much, Rosie. Hi, everyone. I'm Zara Sultana, the Member of Parliament for Coventry South. I'm so excited to speak on this amazing, amazing panel. And like everyone else, I'm really sad that we can't be having this conversation in real life on a field um, in Somerset. But this is a great alternative. I'll speak very briefly about the fight for justice and political change. 
So just, just to start off, my generation grew up to the sound of climate warnings. Every three years, we hear scientists make new and more alarming predictions, but with precious little action from politicians. And now we're running out of time. The effects of the climate emergency are with us already. This winter, on our timelines, we saw videos of Australia burning and Indonesia drowning. And it's clear where the blame lies. It's with the 100 companies that are responsible for 70% of global emissions. It's with the billionaires who have got rich polluting our rivers and pumping out carbon. And it's with an economic system that puts profit before people. The climate crisis is a capitalist crisis and the climate struggle is a class struggle without borders. So wherever you are, if you're working class, you'll suffer the worst effects of floods, fires, droughts and devastation. That grim future is our future unless we take bold political action. And right now, with the coronavirus crisis, we're witnessing what happens when warnings are ignored. We're seeing what happens when a complacent and uncaring ruling class ignore the needs of people. But the future isn't fixed. It's up to us. And as we emerge from this current crisis, we stand at a crossroads, as we have after previous crises. In 2008, the bankers crashed the economy and the rest of us paid for their debts for a decade. By 1945, the working class insisted that if we could house and care for everyone in a crisis, then we could do it in peacetime too. So it will be up to us collectively to shape which path we take from here. It's up to us to organize, educate and make good on an old socialist hymn. With the Green New Deal, we will bring to birth a new world from the ashes of the old. Thank you and solidarity. Thank you so much, Zara. I wish... I wish we were in a big field because I'm sure everyone would stand up and clap uh, to that. Thank you. So I'm going to pass it over to Aisha now um, to speak to yeah, how things are going um, in, the, in the black community. Over to you, Aisha. Yeah, I mean, it's difficult to, to follow um, Zara with her fantastic uh, way of speaking. But I think one thing I did want to pick up from that was this uh, call that we um, organize, educate and make good on that on that promise. I think we're really seeing a critical moment in the movement for black liberation, both here in the UK and across the world. And it's no coincidence that that critical moment has come at a time when everything is changing and the the boundaries of what we thought were possible have completely gone out of the window. Um, I think if you're looking for inspiration for the three themes that this talk is based on, so solidarity, allyship and hope, you really don't have to look any further than the global uprisings for um, Black Lives Matter and beyond right now. Um, it is a time for people who are looking to take action for systemic justice and for change to either take to the streets, to take to the libraries, to take to the internet, to take to Twitter um, in support of uh, what's happening on the ground and what's happening behind the scenes and has been happening for decades. I think a really important thing to have heard is that it might be a kind of moment of the whirlwind right now for the movement um, but it hasn't come from nowhere you know there has been deep building that has been happening uh, across across the world and in kind of in chair in meeting rooms and in councils and whatever for for years and years um, to make this moment possible and even though we've kind of reached a, a catalyst and a tipping point where you know it's wonderful that so many people are, are taking action and getting involved it's really important that we don't lose sight of that um, systemic energy that has gone into getting us to where we are today and I think the the last thing I'll just I'll say about this moment that we're in is we talk a lot about um, the, the fear that after there's a kind of movement surge and, and a trigger moment that the energy will dissipate um, and I think it is both important that we that we let ourselves really kind of revel in this moment of, of, of power um, for the movement. And also we, we remember that kind of, you know, I, I said recently in a similar panel discussion, Martha, uh, Obama popularized that Martin Luther King quote, the moral arc of, uh, of humanity is, is long, but it bends towards justice. And it's like, yes, that's nice and that's true, but only if we bend it. And so I think it's kind of really important to recognize that uh, we're not done. The work is just beginning, um, but we're in a really great place to start. Great. Thank you, Aisha. And Aisha did an amazing um, blog for Vice about, um, about what you can do um, on this issue and, and linking it to the UK and structural racism here. So good, great shout out for that blog as well. 
Okay, um, thank you so much. And now I'm going to pass it over to Nim, um, who's been, yeah, tirelessly fighting for trans rights for a long time and especially um, having a tricky time in the last few weeks. So lots of love to you, Nim. Over to you. Thanks, Rosie. Um, yeah, as you say, it's been a hard time for trans people in the last few weeks. And actually, uh, it links to a lot of what everybody else is talking about during lockdown and COVID. One of the things that's been happening is lots of governments globally have been pushing through under the radar anti-trans policies and rhetoric from Colombia to Hungary uh, and to the US. And recently in the UK, the Minister for Women's Inequalities, Liz Truss, um, made a statement in a committee saying that her priority when coming to looking at our trans legislation, the Gender Recognition Act, um, that her priority uh, was not exactly wholly on board with trans people's rights. So um, the context here during lockdown, during COVID for trans people has been difficult and it's been especially hard when you consider that trans people are living either alone, lots of trans people are homeless or precariously housed, precariously working and or living in hostile or violent households in this time. Uh, so it's not been a great time for trans people. And then you get to this week, uh, and in the middle of a global pandemic and a global uprising for black lives and Pride Month, one of the richest women in the world decided to suddenly out of nowhere start tweeting her views on trans people uh, to 14.3 million followers. Uh, so yeah, uh, that was pretty difficult. Um, and I'm really glad that we have this panel today because one of my personal um, motivations through this has been where's the hope to keep myself going and I had a really good conversation with a friend on Monday when I was feeling I tweeted about JK Rowling's trap uh, tweets on the weekend and one tweet went random I've never had a viral tweet in my life and it went viral uh, and I got a bit of a backlash to that and I was talking to a friend about it and she was like it's literally like five people and 21,000 people like that tweet that's the perspective and that's really carried me through. So JK Rowling's blog post that she wrote yesterday got 55,000 likes. Emma Watson, AKA Hermione, uh, counter tweeted that with a positive tweet and that got 890,000 likes. <laughs> and so my hope is looking at all the people who a year ago as a trans rights activist, I couldn't get to speak publicly about trans rights because they were too scared to be public about their support for us. That that has, the dial on that has shifted phenomenally. Um, and I really saw that earlier in the year when Suzanne Moore wrote a transphobic post in the piece in The Guardian and I helped coordinate a letter to The Guardian in response and we got over 200 signatures of people in less than, I think it was nearly 12 hours. Um, and what's been really noticeable to me in both those incidences is that it's been mostly black women and women of colour who have come forward first and fastest in solidarity. Um, and of course, Zara is one of the few MPs who's actually spoken up and taken the stand for trans rights and wrote an incredible letter to Liz Truss asking her to be accountable to trans people. So Zara, personally, thank you. It meant a lot. Um, and I, but I think it just really lifts up that, that our links have struggled through COVID, through healthcare, um, as a trans person of colour, as I've mentioned, like through race in this moment of black lives, like black trans women are the people at the sharpest end of oppression in our community. Um, they're also linked literally in UK law. There are nine characteristics protected by the Equality Act 2010. Um, trans or gender reassignment is one of them. Uh, race is another, sex is another. Uh, while trans people's rights are under attack in this country, and while we have a government who don't seem to care that much about equality, uh, all of our rights are at risk under legislation. Like we are linked, we are in solidarity, or like we are, our lives are linked together both in reality and in law. Um, and so my hope is our unity, is us building together, um, and is us mobilizing communities and movements that connect us. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Nim. And yeah, this world is a brighter place with you in it. So thank you. Um, okay, and lastly over to Dr. Rita. Um, I always say doctor because um, it's an important part of your achievements as well. Um, and I feel like men get to be called doctor all the time. Uh, so yes, Dr. Rita, over to you about, yeah, a bit about um, um, medicine and the NHS and, um, you know, kind of what happens after the collapse. Over to you. 
Great. Thanks, Rosie. And it's so wonderful to hear you all. Um, tough acts to follow. <laughs> um, 2020 has been a difficult and confronting year, I think, for all of us. Um, and what it feels like to me is that 2020 has removed any sort of veil or pretense that we had around the issues that we felt like we could ignore. The beginning of 2020 meant that we could no longer kick the can of climate change down the road with what was happening in Australia and in Indonesia and still continues to happen. Racism has been brought to the fore and the understanding of structural racism and white fragility has been pushed to the front. And then, as you were saying, with trans rights. And coronavirus has been hugely confronting for how our society is structured and what we find important and where we prioritise um, our time, our energy and our money, really. Um, and what has been really um, revealing for us working within the NHS is firstly how many key workers within the NHS just aren't uh, acknowledged and, and resourced in the way that they should be, whether it's through adequate protection as, you know, PPE, whether it's key workers, cleaning staff, porters, who are outsourced, um, don't have sick pay, don't have holiday pay, whether it's nurses being forced to use food banks. Many who need healthcare during this time have also been too afraid to seek healthcare because of the government's hostile environment policies and because of anti-migrant sentiment. Last autumn, our concerns within the NHS were how we were going to cope with another winter crisis that just gets worse and worse and worse. And we went into this crisis with 50% of the intensive care beds that Italy has and seeing what was unfolding in Italy and being terrified of how we were going to cope when it came here. And over the past 10 years with austerity, we've also increasingly seen how poverty and division and alienation has really uh, made our country sick and made our planet sick. And I think within the context of all of that, actually it's amazing to see how much hope and how much opportunity there is because I think it's through seeing these um, fissures and these ruptures, we are able to see also how fragile the systems are that have upheld this. I mean, the fact that Virgin is essentially um, asking for government bailouts, like what? <laughs> it's been like three months and these structures are falling apart around us. Like what we thought was so infallible and insurmountable is basically just unimportant and insignificant now. So how do we take what this time has shown us and move that forward into creating and demanding a society that, that we want? I think for me, what's been really, really interesting politically is um, how, how, um, how obvious it is that the government lies and how, and how we've just become so accepting of that. And I think that there's been um, a part of society who've maybe known that all along, but I think that it's been picked up across the whole political spectrum now. What's been amazing is seeing how mutual, group, um, mutual aid groups have formed and how people have come together to provide solidarity in a way that doesn't need to be top down and it's really driven by communities and how can we continue to engage those networks and those solidarities that have come up. And um, for me personally, knowing that the climate crisis is the greatest threat to health of this century, what can COVID and our response to COVID teach us about how we plan for future crises moving forwards? And on that note, I think, Rosie, I'll hand back to you. Thank you so much, Rita. Um, and yeah, as you say, these, you know, I think all of you have touched on the fact that all of these issues are interlinked. They all intersect with each other. Um, and, and as you said, Nim, you know, this, all these struggles are interlinked. And I guess I'd like to open up to the floor about a question about how you see these struggles on the ground working together in practice. And what, you know, what does solidarity actually look and feel like? So it's a word that we use, but actually I'd like a bit of substance um, and maybe examples of like what, yeah, what, what really is solidarity? What does it look and feel like to you? So I'll open up the floor and just pop your hands up. Go on, Rita. Yeah, I'll maybe just talk about two groups which I'm involved with. Um, so the first is called Docs Not Cops, and it's specifically... Um, uh, healthcare professionals and people working within the NHS who um, are non-compliant and do not want to be complicit in the government's policy um, of enacting a hostile environment. Um, essentially, what it means is that um, there has been a historic um, uh, information sharing between the NHS and the government, and that's incredibly terrifying for people with uh, precarious um, 
immigration status and also charging for healthcare. Um, and I guess um, it's something which we as healthcare professionals can say that we're not going to do you know, that. That is not <laughs> that is not our work. And creating networks of solidarity that mean that healthcare professionals can work together with um, uh, migrant groups to to know that there is a safe space for people to be able to go if they need healthcare. Because actually what coronavirus has also shown us is that my health is inextricably linked with your health and that we need everybody to be healthy for society, for society to be healthy. Um, the other groups that I'll talk about is um, Doctors for Extinction Rebellion, which is bridging what we know about the climate crisis um, with uh, groups who are taking action on the climate crisis and how can we in our professional capacity come forward and say, look, we know that this is going to be a massive health threat. The GMC, you know, our governing body tells us that we need to act when there are threats to health. And so how can we as a professional group be in service of a wider movement? Um, yeah, I was just going to jump in. I think in terms of the what solidarity looks like, a, a key distinction I think for me is that people need to understand solidarity as something other than uh, kind of doing a favour for someone else. You know, I think something that we've really experienced or I've experienced since the Black Uprisings is a lot of people reaching out to me being like, I'm going to educate myself for you, you know? And I think, and, and that really gets to me because I'm like, you're, I really don't want you to do this if you think it's for me. Like, I want you to understand that my liberation is bound up with yours and until you know, until we're all free, none of us are free. And I think that's something that, especially in the black community, has been understood for a really long time. Um, and when we talk about like what that actually looks like in terms of meaningful solidarity with the global uprisings that are happening at the moment, what it looks like is education, you know, educating yourself and using your privilege to educate the people around you about systemic racial inequality and how it manifests, both at the kind of interpersonal level, institutional level, ideological, all these kind of things. Being that person in your organisation that's willing to stand up and call out racism when you see it and not just back up a black colleague when they eventually do it, kind of, you know, but also I think what it looks like is material redistribution, like actually t thinking about not only where your wealth has come from, but what you could do to serve um, black, uh, black folks and people of colour in the community in terms of redistribu redistributing that wealth um, and also using your kind of uh, power and privilege to start to agitate and organise around some of these uh, kind of deeper, more systemic ideas that are being, being pushed out for a really long time. So as Rita mentioned, white fragility, white supremacy, like how all these things are not only um, incidental kind of um, symptoms of a toxic system, but they're actually inherently embedded um, within its very fabric. Um, and this kind of understanding that the the systems of kind of neoliberal capitalism that we live in um, are absolutely dependent on racial inequality. They're absolutely dependent on keeping trans folks down, keeping communities of colour down, keeping disabled people um, uh, in precarious situations, et cetera, et cetera. And until we actually start to make those links between what the system needs to survive, a system of infinite growth on a finite planet, um, and what and what we all need to survive and thrive as humans, uh, we're not going to be really meaningfully doing solidarity work. So yeah, I think, I think that's what I think, yeah. I'll go next. Um, for me, we've seen solidarity beautifully expressed during this crisis. It's like Rita was saying, there were people clapping appreciating the NHS but at the same time there were people who had never met so many people in their community organizing through mutual aid groups making deliveries for strangers not expecting anything doing it because it was the right thing to do and that's putting off the logic of the free market that expects a payment just to do something and um, beyond that when we look at the Black Lives Matter demonstrations across the world but even in the UK you see that diversity of people especially young people from all backgrounds and I've been involved with campaigns around deaths in police custody ever since I was a student and I've just been absolutely amazed at the turnout while we are in um, you know a pandemic and people are still taken to the streets because you know racism kills um, as well as you know a, a health pandemic killing people and it's just been so inspiring to see people uh, you know taking that on and committing to uh, being anti-racist and educating people and using their privilege putting their people with more privilege putting their lives or their bodies in front of others acknowledging that there is um, a racial hierarchy in operation in this country based on the economic system we live in um, and and that solidarity has been beautiful 
beautiful, but it's been manifesting in so many different ways. Um, as, as others have said that, you know, this system is just exposing us all to. Um, I don't want to go last after all of those. <laughs> It's hard. Um, I was thinking a lot though as you were speaking and I think that there's that there's something that you've all said which is speak up. And I think the thing is is that silence is complicity. Um, I think it's okay to take your time to speak and to think about what you're saying. But if you don't speak up, if people didn't speak up in response to what JK Rowling said, the effect is uh, on trans people is nobody cares. Um, what JK Rowling says is what other people are actually agree with. And that's what the silence means. And having so many other people speak up is what helps to drown that noise out. Um, and, and so I think, first of all, that's really important. It, it literally keeps people alive. And I, that's not hyperbolic. Um, I think the next thing is remembering that there is no such thing as a single issue life. Um, and like everybody else has said, our, our oppressions are connected. And I think that we need to be able to talk about different aspects of our, ourselves um, specifically so that we understand how they're different, uh, how black struggle is different than trans struggle, but we also have to remember that black trans people exist, that trans disabled people of colour like myself exist, um, that as we've talked about healthcare and climate and homelessness, they all weave together. Um, the next thing is, it sounds twee, but to remember the personal is political. Um, and honestly, one of the best acts of solidarity to me as a trans activist to keep going in this lockdown, and I'm not being, I'm not being ridiculous here, was a friend sending me this water bottle that literally measures my hours and how much water I'm consuming per day. Um, and I know that sounds silly, and obviously it's plastic. Um, <laughs> but uh, there are real people doing this work. Um, and reaching out and seeing and caring for the real people behind the struggle is really important, which is my, my last thing is that I think one of the things that we don't talk about with solidarity, often it's like, here's a slogan, change your Instagram profile picture, etc. Most of the work is admin. Most of the work is admin. Real solidarity is being willing to actually do boring ass uh, admin work and like show up and support with emails or minute taking and it's also recognizing that behind every big action and every big thing that you see hours and hours and hours of work went into that from people that you won't see um and i think we live in a time of celebrity um and it's important i mean we're on the customary stage right now uh, <laughs> but it's important i think to remember that this isn't about profile uh like the weaving of neoliberalism that we've been talking about for all of these things. Like this isn't about what this is about. This isn't about being seen to say things. I'm saying speak up. It's not about being seen to speak up. It's about what's, what's the real work going on that makes this possible um, and creates the future that we all want. Amazing. Thank you. And also as someone who works for Greenpeace, I can say it's really important to stay hydrated and don't beat yourself up, Nim, because it's not single use plastic. So you're fine. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah I mean gosh that's, yeah that's just so much amazing gold information and I hope anytime you hear someone say what can I do what is solidarity how can I help others just send them the link to this to this talk so there's so much in there um, and yeah a really poignant point to make about also it's all the things we don't see it's all the things in the background um, and I think there's been a lot of you know, there's been a lot of tips on how, uh, you know, you can, you can um, show solidarity with, with a phone call to a friend, with donating, with, um, with your body, with your voice, but remembering the, the people who aren't in the front of, of, a, of a movement or an image is really important. So thank you for that. Um, so I was going to open up the floor to see if there's any specific points that people want to, to come up on. But I think, I mean, as you said, uh, personal and political, they're, they're very interlinked and we, we are living in political times. And I guess, is there any space um, that you're seeing that's opening up in the political sphere to, to really show that solidarity, that hope, um, that allyship? And we've talked a lot about kind of things on the ground and things in the community, which is extremely important. Um, but I wanted to open up the space for the, the political side, although everything is political. So over to you. I'm looking at you, Zara. 
Okay. <laughs> I was just wondering. I didn't want to. I didn't want to be the the, the, the politician who he takes up <laughs> this one um, at the beginning. But what I would say is that it's so important to make sure you're in a union. Um, I think this crisis has also shown um, just the way our labour market is structured and how we have zero hour contracts. We have precarious work and how that disproportionately affects people of colour. Um, and those same people are the people being disproportionately impacted by COVID and all of these things are completely and utterly interlinked. Um, what I would say is that uh, people need to also, I know it sounds incredibly uh, cliche, but write to your MP. There's nothing quite like filling your MP's inbox up with an issue and making sure that they, they write about it. I've had so many emails about Black Lives Matter, about making sure that we have a curriculum that has colonial history inside of it, because some of the discussions around the Colston statue um, are quite ignorant of the history of this country. And I think that's because of our education system not being fit for purpose and it never has been. So I would say people uh, should obviously also join the Labour Party. But besides that, unionise, um, you know, get involved with the political system locally as well. Councils are really important in terms of distributing resources, supporting mutual aid groups, being able to volunteer at food banks. One of the most um, important things I think I've done over the past few weeks is support the local food bank, which have seen huge um, increase in demand for their for their food, essentially, as more people are seeing redundancies come through as the furlough scheme is coming to an end. So there's a lot of stuff we can be doing that has immediate impact in our communities. Um, and I would stress getting involved. It's, it's important that everyone should be able to do whatever they're most comfortable with based on their own, um, you know, needs and ability from donating to physically being able to help if they can. But there's a lot out there. Um, and there's a lot of people who need our help if we're able to give it. Um, just to piggyback on some on the kind of political question, I know especially in the movement for Black, black Liberation, there's this constant conversation about um, how do we engage with a system that historically hasn't really engaged with us. Um, and I know that's true across lots of different communities. Um, and I think that there is this ongoing conversation about um, yeah, that issue and how, how much we feel willing and able to kind of put our trust in um, elected officials. Um, I think speaking from a personal perspective, I feel like there are some really amazing voices coming out now. Zara is one of them, um, but other people as well who are, po who are politicians who really are kind of interested in, in the question of how do we turn the demands that we're making on the street into concrete legislative change, into policy, things like that. And so I would really encourage people both within the movement and looking to support the movement to kind of, yeah, start thinking that through um, and what that could look like whilst also being mindful of the kind of understandable, I guess, mistrust or unease with maybe engaging with some of those systems. That being said, I think the other thing that I uh, really wanted to lift up was when we have talked about the Black Uprisings um, recently a lot of what's come up has been you know everybody's really willing to point to the states and talk about like everything that's going wrong there and much less willing to um, do the same here and I think there's been a really great public shift uh, particularly with some of the actions around the statues in understanding that we really do have our own problems we have our own kind of cultural uh, colonial erasures we have a hell of a lot to reckon with as a country um, and some of those things are directly linked to the way our politicians of colour particularly black female politicians are treated and when we and when they come out and they call for recognition, for example, with the with the leaked Labour report about their lived experiences as women of colour in the party, or when they come out and they call for an inquiry into BAME deaths or any number of other issues that face black female politicians in particular where are the people who are taking to the streets and taking to Twitter to show solidarity? Like, it is heartbreaking every time. There is a kind of, it feels like someone like Diane Abbott is yelling into the void about her experience of being uh, of of being oppressed as a black woman in politics. Um, and yet there are people who are, you know, more than willing to take to the streets and flood their timelines with, um, I support George Floyd, you know, we can't breathe. And I think it's just incredibly important to recognize that we have our own struggle going on here uh, and it's going on in parliament and solidarity looks like speaking up about that as well. Um, building off of that, I think that one of the things I was gonna say is, um, keep vigilant. Uh, I yeah. think that something that really happens in crisis is that lots of things pass 
under the radar while the media are distracted. Um, and that is true both for trans rights, like I referenced earlier. So like keep an eye out for what's happening around trans rights in the UK, but also globally. But it's also exactly as Aisha just said, true of um, uh, what's happening around pe British people's understanding of British racism. Um, and I think paying attention and starting to really pay attention to the news cycle and what's going on under the surface is really, really important because British people are really detached from British racism. They do think it's an American problem. Uh, and American racism exists because of Britain, <laughs> uh, because of colonialism, because of the British slave trade, um, and so on. Uh, and so... Uh, the next thing is, like people said earlier, is like getting educated, but also remembering this is a marathon, not a race. Um, it, in moments like this, people are very quick to want to be part of the, that, that energy and, and run at it and, and kind of, I mean, I know we keep saying it, but like covering their timeline in something and then the news cycle moves on and next week it'll be something else. Um, that's not how struggle works. It's a marathon, it's not a race. Um, a sprint it's a marathon not a sprint that's what I meant um <laughs> and so like go slow and that's okay but keep going um I think that's really important and yeah I completely again plus one to what Aisha said about um dubiousness of like the state and um etc cetera, etc cetera. but writing to your MPs right now is really important um around trans rights our struggle isn't uh legal it's cultural but it's all being um, fought through uh, the Gender Recognition Act, the Equality Act, and through legal means. And so we do need MPs like Zara, who I'm so grateful for, <laughs> speaking up and holding the government to account and making sure that what happens when they open these laws up isn't regressive and that there are people watching um, and defending us. And so uh, writing to your MPs is right now a really use useful tactic. Oh my God, I can't speak anymore. Useful tactic. Uh, and uh, I just want to plus on that. And um, yeah, that's me. Yeah, maybe I'll just add. Um, it seems like all these threads are so separate, but we know, and what this conversation has really reinforced is that everything is interlinked. And actually, um, with the sort of uprising and the energy that exists outside of our party political space, there will be political change. And what's been really interesting is actually seeing some movements and campaigns that are starting to emerge, things like Build Back Better or um, We Can't Go Back to the Old Normal type ideas, which are pulling together these threads and saying, okay, how does um, coherent political change look going forward that brings together all of these different threads and what might society, society look like that is um, you know, uh, fair and equitable and centers climate justice um, and moves to tear down <laughs> structural racism and um, recognizes trans liberty and, and does all of these things when really, um, re really draws the threads together in something that's cohesive and coherent. And so I think that there's space to be looking for how these campaigns and these narratives are going to emerge. I think moving out of this space, there is going to be a battlefield for who captures that narrative space of what comes after COVID. Um, and we need to be ready with the stories that we want to tell and the visioning of the world that we want to see moving forwards. And I think part of the way that we do that is by continuing conversations like this, by speaking to people who are different to us, because our society is built on division and othering and we need to try and break that down by breaking out of our bubbles um yeah and just you know hold hope take it slow but keep going thank you so much so that's a great uh point to end on and i'm afraid we're, we're actually at time i wish we could carry on but this is just one conversation of many and hopefully those watching you'll um follow these amazing um people on their channels but also you know, have this conversation with your friends and family over the dinner table, over, you know, Zoom drinks, whatever it is. And please, you know, as said, keep keep the momentum going. We can't just have this conversation um, every time, you know, someone's murdered or something happens in the media. It's about it's about the work every day, um, but slowly and mindfully and and with self self preservation at the center. So a huge thank you to all of um, my guests today and thank you to um, Glastonbury and Billy Bragg and Leftfield and the Evis family for making the space for this. 
And I'm going to end on a quote from Audre Lorde, who, if you don't know who they are, then you can look them up. Um, but the quote is, caring for myself is not self-indulgence, it is self-preservation. And that is an act of political warfare. So hopefully you can all uh, look after yourselves, look after each other, have a great summer, and uh, we'll see you next year at Left Field. So if you guys could all come off mute and say bye, that would be lovely to hear your voices. Bye. 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 Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you.